On Chain with Emin Gun Siva. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of the podcast. It's a glorious day here in New York, and there is a lot of stuff to discuss. Um, and uh, and really just uh, just a couple of sort of insights that I had this week from meetings with people in the asset management space. So let's just dive right in because there's been a lot of things, uh, exciting things happening on Avalanche. And uh, the most exciting of which is the Durango release. So uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but obviously we've, we, we have some kind of a scheme, a naming scheme to these releases. Durango is the fourth major release of Avalanche. So uh, very, very routinely, much faster than any other chain. We've been introducing new features and Durango comes to us. And even as I speak, it's active on Fuji. It's ticking along and it has brought to Fuji and it will bring to the mainnet very, very shortly thereafter uh, an amazing new functionality. And uh, along with a lot of cleanup and so on. Uh, but, uh, but I want to go through the, that functionality with you. The main thing it brings is this thing called Teleporter. So what's Teleporter? Teleporter is based on warp messaging, which in turn is based on BLS signatures. What is BLS signatures? It is a way to get a statement from a chain. It is a way to get a statement issued by the current validators that comprise a chain uh, in cryptographic form, signed, subject to all of the full security of the validators that comprise that chain. So that means there are no intermediaries, there are no additional trust assumptions. If you trust the chain, then you trust the BLS signature issued by those validators. So that's uh, that's essentially uh, the ideal, not essentially, that is exactly the, the gold standard, the ideal in trustless technologies. If you have an asset on Avalanche, well then that statement uh, issued by Warp is equivalent to, uh, to essentially, if you trust to, to hold Avalanche to hold an asset for you, then uh, um, uh, the warp messaging adds no additional trust assumptions for you. So, um, but on top of warp, Durango introduces teleporter, a mechanism essentially that makes warp messaging practical and easy to send between subnets. What does that mean? Well, it means this. Now, from here on after, you can start your own subnet and that subnet has seamless access, seamless access to all of the services and features that are accessible on other subnets. What are some examples of things you can do? Well, so a common thing that happens is, um, for example, that uh, somebody wants to start a subnet, but then they realize, you know, actually standing up a chain is hard work. You need to integrate. You need to integrate with, uh, with exchanges. You need to ex integrate with, uh, with oracles. You need to integrate with uh, data providers, et cetera, et cetera. And those integrations already exist on the C chain. And what, Dur what Durango, what Teleporter, and underneath what, what, uh, what Warp working in concert provides to us is the ability to create our own subnets and have them access those integrations that already exist on the C chain. So for example, if you want to, like something that a lot of people want to do is use a chain link Oracle. Well, they, all of those oracles are on the C chain. So now with Teleporter, it's trivial to access those oracles. You want a random number, normally you'd have to go to Chainlink, you'd have to take a ticket, get in their queue, uh, pay them for the integration, et cetera, et cetera. This is why it's so hard for, uh, for a bunch of these other services on other chains to get started. That's is why it's, there are so many ghost chains around. They lack the integrations. That's why it takes a good year for all of these services to get built up on any new chain. We went through that phase with the C chain on Avalanche and the C chain is a rich, uh, thriving ecosystem. And, a, and an issue that some people face is when they want to have their own chain for their purposes. They want to have their own token for staking. They want to have their own token for gas. They want to have their own validator set for compliance purposes. They want to have their own virtual machine. They want to have their own restrictions and rules, again, for compliance or for other reasons. They want to run a different validator set at a higher, hotter setting for higher performance uh, or what have you. The sky is the limit on why somebody might want to create a chain on Avalanche. We support it all, 
But one drawback was, well, if you go at it alone, you might actually uh, be facing a difficult uh, process. You might actually have to pay a bunch of other people for these services you might need. With Teleporter, that's no longer the case. Our vision that was there from the get-go, our vision that you will see get copied by everybody and his brother, they all lack imagination. We are the most copied chain for a reason, and we are the, technologically the most advanced chain we have always been for a reason. You will see other people copy this vision. It's very simple, um, um, an infinite number of chains working in concert. And Teleporter makes that seamless, easy, and uh, cheap, and uh, ultimately so convenient that this is, uh, this is going to be obviously the easiest path to deployment for anybody who cares to deploy a crypto uh, crypto, uh, crypto based, you know, something that's true to crypto primitives. You could always do a, you know, a, some a so called layer two or whatnot. You could always run a chain on your laptop. You could always have a centralized solution. That's fine. Those are fine. But we look down our noses at them because they are not in the crypto spirit. Those people are LARPing and they've been LARPing for two years. We're all waiting that for someday, the, the glorious day that arrives when. Uh, perhaps these things will be decentralized. They'll have a decentralized sequencer, or they will have uh, the they will have fraud proofs, etc. Those things are just not there in any practical form for any of those approaches. But the subnet approach from day one and the subnet vision of seamless chains working in concert is here and practical. So Teleporter makes it even easier to use, and I am so proud of of what the team has put in. Now, is this the end all be all for scaling? No, no, there's much more for us to do, right? So why is there much more for us to do? Because the workloads change underneath us. The space is constantly moving. Inscriptions come in and they put all sorts of unprecedented uh, pressures on the systems underneath, which by the way, the Avalanche chain has withstood the, the immense pressures of inscriptions and it's one of the few that managed to handle those. And uh, so there will be other people who come out and say, oh, well, look, Solana, da, da, da. Solana managed not to have in inscriptions because it doesn't keep full history. Inscriptions don't go there because they don't have full history. Some inscriptions did, but, uh, but they do the things. They have to do things in a very peculiar way over there. Uh, whereas we maintain full history and we maintained the entire load that the inscriptions put in. So um, in any case, still there are many other changes we'd like to make to the underlying system. Um, that's going to be true for anybody in this space, a fast moving space. This is the cutting edge of tech. We knew, um, you know, we developed the techniques to build web two solutions over multiple decades. And, um, and so when the web took off, we actually had the intellectual background. We knew how to build those services. Web3 wasn't exactly the same way. When Bitcoin came out, when Ethereum came out, there was a, an arduous process up ahead. And, uh, and now I think what we're beginning to show to the world is some of these things are becoming solved solutions. If you want true decentralization, you want fast consensus, Avalanche consensus is here. If you want to support as many applications as you can with all of the flexibility that, uh, that customization can provide, then subnets are the way to do, to do this in. And, uh, and of course, seamless integration between subnets, a la Durango, a, a la Teleporter, a la Warp, is exactly where the action is. So I'm really, really proud of what, uh, what, uh, uh, what Avalanche supports today. And I'm really, really happy uh, to see that people are now beginning to think about you know, starting subnets for each and every application that is, that is demanding, for each and every application that might want to have its own rules, uh, its own uh, and want, wants to decouple itself from the gas fees on on the C chain, etc. So this is a fantastic development. I'm really proud of the team, and uh, you will also notice. You should notice certain sort of meta messages. I do this, uh, you know. I talk, and uh, you know, I have these like conversations with everyone. I love doing these. Um, and it takes a while for people to catch on to what's happening behind the scenes. So let me try to speed this up for, for everyone. If you look around, there's only one team that isn't just copying basic, basic broken stuff from each other. Okay. So uh, there's only one team that's not relying on just throwing hardware at the problem of scaling. That's us. There's only one team that advanced the science of blockchains from where it was, from where Satoshi left it, 
to the next level with the avalanche consensus. There's only one team that has proposed a solution to scaling that did not involve having to solve a bunch of unsolved problems that still remain unsolved after two and a half years. And there's only one team that's delivering at a clip like this. So I'm really proud of the Avalanche ecosystem, really proud of the Avalanche, uh, Avalanche community for bringing us to where we are today. So um, it's activated, Durango activated on Fuji, and um, it's been ticking along there, as I alluded to earlier. And what does it mean? I think I, I gave you sort of both the practical impacts, and the practical impact is seamless, transparent integrations between subnets. You can start your own chain for your own purposes, get access to everything on the C chain, uh, get access to integrations with uh, exchanges, get access to oracles, get access to other services that might exist on the C chain, and, uh, uh, and, and make it all transparent. So what's next? There's quite a bit more that's in the pipeline, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be very, very happy to go into that in subsequent discussions and podcasts. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, I'm not a big fan of talking about and dangling in front of people sort of new stuff that is to come uh, because uh, just, you know, it's just A, because we get copied a lot, and B, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a fast-moving, uh, fast-changing field. So, But I'm super, super excited about, uh, about what Durango gives us and I'm super excited about this vision that we have realized of transparent communication between subnets. Okay, uh, so what else is happening? Well, another thing that's very, very big is the push to get institutional partners on chain. You know, there are a whole bunch of people who play these games of, uh, of the crypto games, and there are many different things you can do, right? The easiest game that I saw from a founder uh, three days ago uh, was he was trying to get a picture of his with Vitalik. Okay, so that's the easy game, the Vitalik proximity game. You could play that. Uh, you could try to pretend to be, you know, whatever, this, that, and the other. Great, that's that's a game. Uh, those are all cannibals masquerading as, uh, as, uh, as aligned, um, and uh, they're just wolves in, in sheep's clothing. We've been here since day one bringing new use cases to crypto. We've been here since day one coming into the scene with a new architecture that can accommodate use cases that others cannot accommodate. We're not a single chain. We're not a one size fits all solution. We're not hampered by the fact that we have only one rule set that must conform to some jurisdictions, laws, et cetera, requirements, et cetera, and cannot do that because it's just one chain and you can't be everything to everyone at the same time. We're multiple chains and they can be specialized for different purposes. And that gave us a huge advantage. And that's why we've always been looking out from crypto to regular traditional finance, to, to show them what crypto can do for them, to integrate their solutions or their services with the much better rails that crypto offers, to bring to them all of the benefits of cryptography, all of the benefits of, of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. So to that end, I think uh, I talked to you at length about the Spruce effort. So we have this big overarching umbrella called Evergreen. So you will hear from me on uh, a bunch of different fronts. I have had to open up that Wikipedia page to all of the evergreen trees. I have to ask me anything about conifers and, and pine trees and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we have quite a few of these in the works. But Spruce was one of the first ones. And uh, it, had, uh, uh, it had quite a few players in it. And Citigroup has been, uh, has been evaluating Spruce as, uh, as a potential platform for Rails. Now, some of you, I, I'm sure, um, have worked on Wall Street and or in financial institutions. If so, you know the Rails that they use today. You know uh, all about bitemporal databases. You know all about these funky, very complicated um, sort of overstructures or superstructures that they've built on top of, of regular databases to try to keep uh, multiple databases in sync to try to achieve uh, this, uh, this, uh, this merger between multiple timelines that participate, where, where multiple machines participate in the transaction. So, and if you've ever seen that code base, you've seen layers upon layers, and sometimes the layers are so ancient, it's kind of like going to Rome or Istanbul or, 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 or Jerusalem or something, where you look and you see all these, uh, these different cultures that have left behind their, their stones, right? You've, got the Roman stuff and then the Greek stuff and then the prehistoric stuff underneath. All the way down, sometimes you find COBOL. And every now and then you see job, uh, 
uh, advertisements looking for these uh, these unicorns that uh, that you know that get paid a hell of a lot of money because they they speak the COBOL language from 19 I think 1970s early 70s a lot of financial rails go all the way back to this ancient archaic stuff so if you think about what that what they have to deal with today and you compare it to what you and I can easily do with a very simple wallet um, it's night and day and uh, and so they need to have, you know, these institutions need to now develop the spine required or the confidence required or the trust required to be able to say, OK, well, these old rails are, are not very good. And these other ones have enormous advantages for us. The time has come. I talked to you uh, a couple of years ago about a big trend in tech, and that is the, the bringing of, of cutting edge IT. You take any prosaic, any dumb area hailing a taxi. You throw some, some simple Web2 at it, and then you have yourself a ginormous multi-billion dollar company. Maybe you have two of them. You have Uber and Lyft, maybe maybe more. Um, and uh, a similar thing is going to happen in finance. It's way overdue. It's overdue by about 10 years, maybe more. Uh, they've been hampered by regulation. They've been hampered by lack of suitable underlying platforms. But the time is now coming, and the platforms have now matured. Some of them are far better than others. Now, within the crypto circles, I understand how people think very, very well. And, uh, and I know why they're in the ruts that they're in. I know why those teams cannot deliver. And that's exactly partly why my team can deliver so well. Um, and, and of course, the Avalanche community can deliver so well because we're not falling into those ruts. Um, in that crypto's context, I know what people are saying and what people are doing, et cetera. Oh, this is like this and that. This is fast. Protodank sharding will solve this and that. And this other new solution will come like umpteen years from now. And then suddenly, you know, just like Godot will show up someday and life will be fantastic. So I don't know if Godot will ever show up. He hasn't shown up yet. I've been hearing this for a decade now. I know that what we have is a fantastic solution. And uh, I know that it was designed from the ground up for institutional adoption. I know, for example, it's proven beyond belief that uh, uh, beyond doubt rather, proven beyond doubt by multiple scientific parties and peer review and so forth, that avalanche consensus is far faster because it doesn't perform all to all communication. So um, we're in a universe where we can tackle the incredibly demanding performance requirements of institutional uh, uh, players here. And we also have the architecture that I mentioned where anybody with specific regulatory compliance requirements can have a chain that fits their needs. Anybody with particular functionality requirements can come up with a virtual machine that fits their needs. And I'll talk about that in subsequent uh, podcasts as well, because we have multiple virtual machines, the Move VM and others coming on to Avalanche. So we're looking at a, at a very rapidly evolving world, and it's time to, to get the institutionals to get comfortable with this coming revolution. And that's exactly what we've been working on. I've told you this multiple years ago, and behind the scenes, it's been a constant thing at Ava Labs. It's been a constant thing um, by members of the Avalanche Foundation to get big players uh, to understand that many of the worries uh, that, that they might have with, uh, with cryptocurrencies, many of the, the ideas that they formed when they evaluated, when they looked at first generation systems like Bitcoin, or they looked at second generation systems like Ethereum, and they formed certain pre preconceived notions, those are addressed now. They are solved problems. You don't see me in engaging in all of those grinding, silly discussions that you see a lot of people uh, LARP in, right? Then they're LARPing academics, right? They're, they're acting like, oh, you know, this and that, crypto, this, VDFs here, VRFs there, et cetera. I, I don't engage in that because we don't need that complexity. We don't play that game of let's hold a, 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 let's dangle some kind of carrot in front of our audience while we deliver them technology from 1999. Instead, we have given you technology that is cutting edge and it solves those problems. We're ahead of that game by head and shoulders. So, um, but as I said, it's still going to be a process for institutionals to come to grips and to understand what these new technologies do. And as part of the evergreen efforts we're, um, in the Avalanche community, we're working with multiple different consortia that are looking at adopting a chain of some kind or another, a subnet of some kind or another, 
uh, for their own uses. And Citi has been looking at Spruce uh, for tokenization. And they just issued a report on, on their findings. This is a third party, and uh, it's just an independent third party, and uh, it is an uncorrupted third party. It's not one of these third parties that got paid by somebody. This is really just Citi on their own uh, doing their thing. I wish I could corrupt them, uh, but uh, but you know we just city cannot be bought like that, and uh, nor nor would we have the resources to be able to buy city. I, I don't know how much it would cost. Probably many 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 hundreds of billions of dollars. So what did they test? They tested a bunch of things um, for um, uh, on for uh, their use cases. Obviously starting with end to end token transfers, secondary transfers, and validating new capabilities with collateralized lending. So what does that mean? Uh, they went onto a chain. Uh, very much like a like a like a essentially it's it's an EVM based chain that we uh, built with them for them etc. And on that chain they did what a DGen would do on on their first day on a chain right they purchased some digital assets they moved them around they bought them sold them to each other in this uh, fake environment and um, and uh, they checked uh, how it how easy it was to to do collateralized lending to borrow against those assets and the report is that uh, the technology is transformative. I'll read you the, the quote from uh, Mark Garabedian. The Avalanche Spruce Test Network has proven to be an ample technical sandbox environment for exploring the potential of a blockchain technology within our in industry. So um, this is, uh, this is uh, you know how academics are always subdued. Uh, you should see the financial folks, um, and the ones not the ones that are uh, that are pushing assets, but the ones that are actually at uh, austere uh, institutions like City. Uh, this is this is the the, the sort of the, the kind of uh, uh, thing that you might hear them say when uh, when they say want to say, look, this technology just works. It does what it says it does, and um, and that's what sets us apart. It's that simple, and the people who are going to win this game are going to be those people who not, don't just you know turn heads and, and, and make up terms, et cetera, and keep the game going for, for as long as possible. But instead, they're going to be the ones who deliver the tech that actually gets stuff done. And that's what we've done. And I'm really, really happy to have third party uh, recognition of exactly that fact. All right, um, so let's, uh, let's wrap up. The last thing I want to touch upon is the thriving NFT um, community on Avalanche. We have uh, uh, the volumes, the NFT volumes are, are, uh, are ever growing. Uh, when I look around on the, on the net, um, it's uh, on the chain rather or, or wherever it is oh, in, com in the community forums and so on. There are a lot of people trading NFTs on Avalanche now compared to say a year ago. And um, that's uh, it's fantastic to see. And, uh, and there's a lot of excitement I hear from, uh, from budding artists uh, that uh, that are excited. I hear from from people who uh, played with NFT marketplaces on Avalanche. So um, so it's really really fascinating to see the growth of that community. And um, one of the new things that has helped here is Salvor. Uh, they allow you to do lending against NFTs. It's worth checking out. It's not an endorsement. Anytime I mention something, people are like, "Oh, he's endorsing." I'm not an, I'm not endorsing anything. Do take a look though. It's interesting what they've built. It's uh, it might be useful to you. Might not. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's also a lot of activity on NFTs and gaming. And I'm really, really thrilled about what's about to happen in the gaming space. I talked to you about uh, uh, Shrapnel and Off the Grid. I'm super excited about both. Uh, I told you that I was going to buy a gaming system. I'm partway in, in that process of getting my gaming system ready. And, uh, and I cannot wait. And I think I might have told you that I played a bit of a role in Off the Grid. And uh, I think I, I don't know if I told you, but I occasionally have dreams where I'm in that city or in that off the grid where I played for 20 minutes and I still have flashbacks to that uh, rundown, super cool place. And, uh, and I want to run around in it again. I want to kill some bad guys and, uh, you know, overturn some ambulances and whatnot and, and drive them around, etc. It's going to be so much fun. Um, and uh, gaming and NFTs go hand in hand. So it's high time for us to move beyond PFPs. Uh, PFPs are wonderful. There's nothing wrong with them, but there are so many other use cases for NFTs. NFTs in gaming is going to be a fascinating field, and uh, there will be all these uh, all these game items that outlive the games for which they were designed. 
Uh, I think we might very well start seeing things like, you know, somebody starts developing a set of a quiver of weapons, et cetera, et cetera, in some gaming universe that they then take with them for a very long time to come, maybe through adulthood and, and, and late life even. So I'm really excited about this, the Marvel Universe, the DC Comics Universe, et cetera. Those kinds of things are essentially just NFT universes or will be NFT universes that we operate in, uh, where games are designed for, where uh, items from one game interoperate with items from another. And it's going to be a fascinating field uh, to watch grow. So, um, so that's sort of what's happening. And those are the three main things that I wanted to pick up on today. Um, there's other stuff that's happening. Let me touch upon some of the funny things that, that I saw today. Um, so one interesting thing was, um, was a, um, a, a tweet from, uh, from one of from, uh, the Polygon CEO uh, saying that uh, there would be um, that anytime you see a, a project leave an ecosystem, then, um, then you should think about how much they got paid to move. Well, we're seeing a lot of uh, games and a lot, no, not a lot of games, a lot of projects, not just games, a lot of projects leave Polygon because their supernets don't work. Uh, you might remember that supernets, there was no supernet documentation. Polygon used to refer people to subnet documentation uh, because it was just a copied idea that they got from us. They changed the name barely and they were referring their users to our documentation for some time. It was that asinine. So, um, so that same folks who did that are now saying, oh, people only leave us when they get paid. No, people are leaving you in droves because your technology doesn't work. They're coming to a, another person who is offering them another system, another community that's offering them tech that fits their needs. That's exactly what's happening. And in fact, it's the, it's the exact opposite of what they're saying. They're not getting paid to leave. They're leaving money behind to leave for a system that actually works. So we're finally getting to the chapter where it's put up or shut up. And, uh, and, uh, and we've put up essentially the most fantastic um, ecosystem that I can imagine at the moment. And um, uh, we've put together as a community a fantastic ecosystem overall. And I'm really proud of, uh, of the, the general trends that I'm seeing. Speaking of general trends, um, I was in a series of meetings, a series of dinners uh, this week, one with, uh, with some, uh, let's just say, uh, with a very, very large, very large TradFi institution that, uh, that they organized with a whole bunch of, um, a bunch of asset managers. And uh, I think I was the only, only crypto founder. No, I was one of the two crypto founders there. Um, and... Um, and then, uh, then the next day, I was at a meeting with uh, with a bunch of hedge fund people and um, some politicians who are interested in the uh, the sort of the uh, the coming of age of crypto. And uh, it was really interesting. Let me give you some vignettes. And uh, and I'm, it made me so bullish about where the space is going to end up, and it made me understand what the trends are that I'm seeing. It turns out that uh, the BlackRock ETF. The, the you know you, you all know that uh, that uh, the SEC approved uh, I believe eleven different ETFs. They're all ETFs that are looking to purchase Bitcoin. So those eleven BTFs um, of those eleven BTFs, one of the big ones is by BlackRock. BlackRock, for those of you who don't know, is the world's largest asset manager. So they've been around for a very long time. They have uh, many trillions in assets, and they have multiple different ETFs that they've done over time. The Bitcoin ETF is apparently the most successful ETF to date. And so I think at this point, we should just sort of st step back and, and say, yes, of course, we told you so. You know, as early adopters, I think we get to say that and we get to feel proud. Um, but I want to tell you just how successful this ETF is. It's not, it's not just the most successful ETF that BlackRock has ever done. BlackRock's done a lot of ETFs over multiple decades. If you were to take every single ETF that BlackRock has ever done and you combine them all and you treat it as if, as if they were started on the same day and, and you sum it up, then the Bitcoin ETF is more successful than that fictitious virtual combined ETFs of, of all ETFs that BlackRock has done. So I want to leave you with that thought. 
uh, there is a lot of excitement in the digital asset space for, uh, or in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the asset management space for digital assets. And uh, the day when uh, asset managers, you know how asset managers work is, uh, you know, if somebody's thinking about retirement, the, you know, at some point in your life, even, even you Zoomers will at some point have to do this. It feels like a very long time away, but it isn't. At some point, someone, you will have to talk to someone and they will tell you how to allocate your retirement funds. You will have a nest egg at some point. You know, I was a professor at Cornell. It wasn't very big, but no matter what, you know, at some point you'll have some, some amount of, of uh, resources to manage. And they give you model portfolios. So, um, so you, know, at the, you know, common things that might exist in a portfolio are things like stocks, bonds, etc. cetera. So, uh, and today they would be just traditional instruments in, the, in those portfolios. But what I'm hearing is that the days are where asset managers might advise people to hold risky assets, alternative, what they call these alternative assets, in, including crypto, uh, where say a percent or two of somebody's retirement savings might be allocated to, to crypto are not very far from today. If this were to happen, this would be an amazing boost to our space. And, uh, and it's, it, to me, it seems inevitable. To me, it seems that there is definitely, a, the, this is the emergence, we talked about this before, the emergence of a new asset class is, uh, is always kind of rough and kind of unknown and, and risky, of course. Uh, but I think we're over the hump where uh, these assets can be ignored or banned. I think even, even certain people, even certain politicians who've been trying to ban this space will ultimately come to realize that they, that they just can't ban it. And in fact, they as you can see with the Bitcoin ETF, that, it, that they had to recognize that some parts of this space are clearly legitimate. There are good actors here. There are decent assets in this space. Uh, there, are, there are flagship assets. And, um, and those will end up playing a big role as we move forward. So I want to leave you on that note. I was in these two separate meetings and I left them thinking that, uh, that this space is incredibly bullish. It made me feel, frankly, and you know, between between a lot of us, um, I have to say, I was a little bit disappointed. I wanted a little bit longer of a bear market because bear markets clean out bad behavior. You know, the, the beginning of the last bear market got rid of uh, some bad actors. It got rid of FTX silliness. It got rid of quite a few, not all, but quite a few of the SAM coins that were artificially propped up by our savings. So, uh, so that was good. And I needed, I think I needed, but I wanted a little longer uh, of a bear market to clean up the space a little bit more. There are still some stragglers, there are still some BS artists in this space. But, um, uh, but regardless, I'm thrilled to see uh, signs of bullishness. I'm thrilled to see uh, this much interest from the general public for Bitcoin, the, the granddaddy of all digital assets. And, um, and I cannot wait to see where uh, where this journey takes us. It's going to be a fun space. It's going to be, uh, I think, uh, an exciting uh, time for all of us ahead. Now, talking about where, where time will take us, um, let me just mention that I'm going to be at ETH Denver. Um, so uh, uh, I just made the decision to go there. Um, I, uh, I saw Vitalik last fall and uh, want to see him again soon. And I would very much like to also connect with my uh, friends in the uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem in the L2 ecosystems, and uh, and talk to them about uh, about the, the things that we are doing. Um, again, at the high level, so at the meta level, Avalanche is not Ethereum. It's it's different. Our future roadmap is very different. We do not believe in these centralized solutions, and ethically. And ethos-wise, so value-wise, we're very different. We don't believe in dangling promises in front of people. We do not believe in selling centralized solutions as if they're decentralized. We do not believe in creating disparity between the narrative and the reality. So that's very different from us. Um, there are many other similarities. We believe in the EVM as a programmable uh, platform. We also believe in other virtual machines. We support multiple of them. But, but we certainly started out with the EVM being the, the programmable C-chain uh, foundation for us. And uh, we've done quite a lot to bring people onto EVM solutions. We've done quite a lot to teach people Solidity. 
uh, we've done quite a lot to uh, to work with uh, with a lot of young people uh, who are building solutions to get them onto the EVM. So we've done quite a lot for EVM dominance. We've done this without cannibalizing Ethereum. So I'm really proud of that. We're not like those L2s. We've brought new assets and new ideas and new solutions into the space. Uh, so we have a very different vision for how to proceed forward. Um, and, uh, uh, and Ethereum is always going to be a single chain system. And uh, Avalanche from the get-go was a multi-chain system. So we have a very different underlying architecture as well. But when you sort of put us in a bag and shake us with them, we are all the same, right? So we we have we have the same technological foundations, and uh, and you know we are socially very well connected to the Ethereum community. Most of my uh, team at Ava Labs came from uh, prior jobs working on Ethereum-based uh, solutions. So I cannot wait to go to ETH Denver. I cannot wait to talk shop with people. I cannot uh, wait to find out about EIPs that might that people might be thinking about submitting. Um, oh, um, ethos-wise, there's also a couple of other differences at the foundation level. So we have the Avalanche Community Proposals, ACPs. They're slightly different than EIPs. And um, we track many of the EIPs, the good EIPs in, our, in, in, uh, in, in the Avalanche Community opinion that we like um, as a community, uh, they get turned into ACPs. It's a community process. If you would like Avalanche to do something that other chains don't, uh, or do, or even those, um, especially if other chains don't do it, then submit it as an ACP. And uh, and it's, as you know, we deliver very, very fast. Uh, we're, we're a fast moving team. We're very different from others in that respect. So, and we are very eager to take cool new technologies, cool new ideas, and uh, and adopt them either into into one of the XP or C chains or into a different subnet in some cases. So, um, so if you have ideas on how to how to move Avalanche forward, the ACP process is there. It's gotten a lot of attention from a lot of people. There's been a lot of vigorous discussion on there. So, uh, so do participate if you have ideas. And, um, and rest assured that the Avalanche Foundation is incredibly cutting edge and incredibly fast moving. So, uh, so, so, uh, so we're, they're going to be adopting um, the, uh, the, the best ideas in, from the ACP process and issuing them on chain. So um, I'm going to be at ETH Denver. I'll be connecting with the other folks there. And um, I'm very much looking forward to it. A few people from uh, Ava Labs will be with me as well. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, to seeing some of you there. Um, and of course, um, the uh, Avalanche Summit was announced earlier this year. It's going to be in Buenos Aires. I'm super excited to be in, uh, in Argentina in uh, October-ish. The exact dates have not been announced yet, but it's going to be around October. So um, I can't wait to see you all. Cannot wait to see you uh, in person at one of these venues. And certainly can't wait to see all of you on chain. Take care.